Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to Talking Maths in Lockdown. Um, increasingly not so much in lockdown, but I guess the, the name exists, so we'll stick with it. Uh, so this is part of a series of events that are being organised by Talking Maths in Public, which is an organisation for maths communicators uh, and people who communicate maths in various different forms to get together and share skills and meet each other and network. Um, and we're trying to run these online events uh, during the time when it's not possible to meet up in person um, because we uh, can't run any real real events so we're bored uh, we are not bored to be clear we're completely off our feet with work but anyway uh, we're doing this anyway uh, before we go any further into that we should introduce the talking maths in public committee so i uh, i'm katie steckles i'm a member of the talking maths in public committee i am a maths communicator i'm freelance and uh, do all forms of maths communication almost exclusively online at the moment um, but i also do writing and videos and various other things um, I will pass over to the next member of the team of committee, which is Sam. Hi, I'm Sam Durbin. I, when I'm not on fellow, I work for the Royal Institution and I manage our secondary maths masterclass program all across the UK. Um, when I am on fellow, I do things like this and sit here and have existential dread. Um, Katie's saying we're really busy. No, we are really busy. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to pass on to Ben. <laughs> So you're allowed to do this because you're not paid. That's that's the crucial thing. Basically, like, yes, yes. I'm yeah, here voluntarily. Uh, I don't know why. Charitable undertaking to improve the world of mass communicators, or at least make something happen in the world of mass communicators. My name's Ben. I work for the Advanced Mass Support Programme for half of my time. I'm kind of employed by the University of Bath, and they claim a tiny bit of my time, part of which I'm going to talk about today. And the rest of my time, I do mass communication, outreach, training, enrichment, whatever you want to call it freelance as well occasionally i do that in person although not for a while although some bookings are coming in again for over the next year we'll see if they're allowed to uh, i do it i've been doing it a lot online since march and uh, occasionally i get to do it on the internet sort of in less live format so via youtube so i've done quite a few videos for the number file channel which is a different way of communicating maths and there's a lot of fun to be part of uh, I'm one of the team organisers and I'm also speaking a bit later on so I'll say a bit more about what I'm talking about later but now I'm going to hand over to Kevin our final member of the team IP team. All right hello uh, I'm Kevin Houston I'm actually a lecturer at the University of Leeds but I'm also the ed uh, education secretary of the London Mathematical Society and uh, I'm interested in mass communication but uh, I've not been doing much over the last few months I've I've mostly been preparing for the onslaught of teaching in uh, the coming the coming months where we have to move all our teaching online at the universities so uh, i've been dealing with that and uh, in the past week i've been mostly having a cold so my voice may sound a bit funny and uh, <laughs> to, to, just to save me talking i think i'll just stop there and hand back to katie Excellent, fantastic. So um, we're the sort of four main uh, team of people. Um, if you have any questions or any problems in the session, we should all be co-hosts on the call. So you should be able to send us private messages in Zoom if you need to. Um, and you will see kind of what, what roles we're each taking within this. Um, so the session today is on mass communication teaching or teaching mass communication skills in a university context. Um, so kind of universities that offer either uh, full courses in uh, communication skills, um, often in science communication, and sometimes within, for instance, a maths degree, you might have a module which is dedicated to the topic of communicating maths. Um, and we're basically gonna have a few guests who are gonna share their um, experiences with those things, um, which might be in of interest to people who are thinking about setting up similar um, types of modules or training within their own maths departments or, or for people who are interested in, in getting this kind of training as well. Uh, or just anyone who's interested in things because that's also a legit thing to be interested in. Um, so uh, we'll introduce I guess shortly there will be each of them talking for about 10 minutes about what they've done and what they're going to do and what they're currently doing and then we'll have time for a bit of Q&A after that as well. Um, we will do a sort of wrap up thing at five o'clock, but if you are happy to stick around after five o'clock, we'll carry on until half past with uh, what we call the extended Q&A, which is any further questions or discussion that wants to happen then. And we might lose some of the speakers or some of the other participants at that point, but hopefully um, there'll be continued chat. 
uh, we will be recording the session and we're going to put this on to our YouTube channel along with all of our other Talking Maths in Lockdown sessions. Um, so if you don't want to be seen on the recording, make sure that your video is muted. Um, but hopefully it will just be the speakers and the um, pans being rattled around the kitchen um, that you see on the video. Um, if you want to ask questions in the Q&A, we'll be doing that through the chat. So please, uh, if you get any burning questions for the speakers, put them into the chat and we will have Sam is going to wrangle that when we come to Q&A time. If you want to ask a question anonymously, you can send a private message to Sam who can read out your question, um, you know, without saying who it's from. Um, and that's how we're going to do the Q&A. Um, so one more thing to say before we start is that we have a code of conduct for these sessions, um, which hopefully we can stick a link in the chat to that. If you uh, received the email about this session, it will have been included in there as well. Um, if you haven't had a chance to have a look yet, please do, because uh, it's important that everyone is aware of our code of conduct. And uh, essentially it says, you know, be welcoming, polite, respectful and uh, make sure that you don't use any exclusionary language or um, say anything unwelcome and also uh, make sure, uh, remember that people are, might share things in this uh, call which they're happy to share in the context of this but not necessarily elsewhere so try not to kind of without permission share things that you've seen or heard here elsewhere uh, without checking with that person first. So hopefully that is all the things I have to say so I will crack on uh, with introducing our first speaker if that's okay. Is that are the committee on board with that? They're variously nodding. I will go ahead. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker um, who uh, has come to talk about the uh, science communication master's course uh, at the University of Manchester. Um, and I'm sure he could probably tell you a lot more about it than I can. Uh, so I'll just hand over um, to James. Thank you very much, Katie, and uh, hello to everyone. It's great to be able to sort of see you in this um, strange environment. And uh, first of all, thanks very much to the organisers for setting this up and for giving me 10 minutes to talk about a programme which is not about maths or not specifically um, about maths. So, um, but hopefully um, some of you will listen to this and uh, you'll be thinking, um, well, I can see how this could possibly complement um, some of what I'm doing uh, of a more specialised nature. Um, so this is a, um, this is a full uh, postgraduate uh, master's course. So it's um, one year full-time or two years part-time. Um, it's in, uh, in normal times, it is an attendance-based course, um, so we don't, uh, we don't have a, an online or distance learning equivalent of this course, uh, except during a global pandemic, when uh, in fact we very much do. Um, it's a course which uh, it attracts a certain number of people who are in the kind of situation which I imagine most of you are. You are, you are already established, you have careers, um, you are looking for something that will give you some conceptual underpinning or you want a bit of experience of things that you're not getting uh, in your current roles. Um, you want to do a bit of uh, applied study in a particular area. Um, that's, um, well, this year, probably this will be, that will be about a third of our students um, have, have that kind of background, that kind of experience. We tend to get about 30 odd students um, per year. Um, a somewhat larger number of the students are relatively young. Um, they will have done uh, very often uh, science, uh, science degrees comparatively recently. And those people tend mostly, uh, one of the first things that we say to the students is that in a lot of um, science communication careers, um, you don't necessarily get to specialize. Um, so in a lot of public engagement stuff, a lot of museums and science centres stuff, certainly journalism, um, you, you would be working in a, a variety of fields. So we encourage people to keep their options open as far as possible and to look at a wide variety of stuff. The overall scope of the programme is science, technology, engineering, maths, medicine and healthcare pretty much. Um, so I will just switch into this other view and um, you will see here um, I'm not actually, uh, I don't run this program, um, we have uh, an, an excellent uh, team of people. Um, so our program director and in fact her, her deputy uh, Elizabeth and Harriet 
are both, um, they work more on the medical and healthcare side. And that's, um, that's, a, that's one of the biggest recruitment areas uh, on the program. Oh, yeah, we got the link there in the chat. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, and so they are specialists uh, in those areas. Um, I'm talking to you because my own background is more on the physical sciences side, the computer science um, side. Um, we have tended not to have um, many mathematicians um, on the programme so far, apart from um, uh, the occasional statsy healthcare person. Um, but uh, I would say it is useful to get a range of different perspectives. The, the medical people in particular, they do a lot of patient engagement stuff, which is quite different from the public engagements um, that you might experience um, in the, uh, in the sciences, but uh, it has particular features which make it worth paying attention to. They are very good at, they, they deal a lot with issues of risk. They deal a lot with um, talking to audiences in sometimes life or death situations. Um, they're very good on things like disease communication, obviously highly topical area. Um, it's useful, well, a lot of our students find it useful to be in a room with, when we can get a room, when there isn't a global pandemic, um, a number of people who've got different experiences and who can bring uh, in, and share those, those experiences. So um, I will just, uh, all of this information, uh, if you want to get this information, then uh, you can email me. I'll put my address uh, in the chat, um, but uh, just to pop this up here. So this is the structure of the programme. The University of Manchester goes on a semester structure. So that's um, semester one, um, September to February, semester two, February to May and then the summer. It's a 12 month course, not like an undergraduate program. So the, uh, the summer is, uh, is conventional study time and you spend that doing a research project. So whereas the program, the taught elements are quite wide ranging, most people who've got an existing specialism tend to do something along the lines of the, that specialism for their research project. There's also a mentored project which has to produce some kind of real world um, outcome as a piece of science communication work which is done uh, in collaboration with what we call a mentor, so a person um, in an existing professional career who provides support. Um, and I'll just show you the, the part-time equivalent. As you can see, it's the same courses doing half the amount of stuff at any given time over a period of twice as long. So it's, uh, so it's two years. And um, these are designed, although you have to be on campus, these are designed um, to limit the number of days people have to attend because we have a lot of students who have jobs um, who are working part-time often quite a lot of hours um, alongside these courses so usually as a um, as a part-timer you can get by with one day's attendance um, per week now as to what we actually teach well i'll tell you what we don't teach we don't teach or we don't formally teach the practical skills. So we're not going to tell you how to explain group theory using a Rubik cube, or how to get a room full of kids to calm down, or what's most relevant to key stage three, or how to do a risk assessment, or anything like that. We don't try to teach those in the classroom setting because that's not the right way to do that. We find that people learn those skills best um, on the job, or in, in volunteering roles or in any more practical way. What we can do is help out with the kind of networking that people need to be able to get into those sorts of roles. And we're happy to give feedback and we're happy to discuss how those kind of practical activities can feed into the research projects at the end of the year. Um, but the actual formal teaching that we do is it's more general and it's more overarching. So for instance, we talk about um, 
different um, theoretical approaches to science communication. You don't need theory to be able to do it, of course, but some people find it very useful to have a background in the sort of the history of the various models that have developed and how they've influenced why people do what they do. So we talk about the great uh, shift towards the public engagement model and away from what used to be called the public understanding model, the approach that assumes that people didn't know about stuff, so you had to fill their heads up with knowledge. Um, so we talk about the, the realization that treating people like they're ignorant doesn't work, and the, the, later, the somewhat later realization that scaring people doesn't work. Okay, climate change may be scary, but it turns out if you try to scare people into changing their behavior, it doesn't work at all. There is ongoing debate about whether willfully disgusting people is a useful communication technique or not, particularly among the historians of, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the people who communicate medicine. Um, we talk about journalism. Uh, we have, uh, as you'll see, we have a unit um, there it's called Science, Media and Journalism. So we talk about um, things like news values, the, uh, the concepts that are in the heads of editors when they are commissioning pieces, the way journalists sculpt pieces of work to get a readership or to hold a readership the way usually if it's news journalism you don't just have to be interesting you have to be topical there has to be a clear hook there has to be something you can express in the form of a headline um, we talk about the way newspapers frame stories we talk about sometimes how you end up with an apparent conflict uh, between individuals or groups when there isn't really one going on at the level of the science. Um, we talk about the practicalities of the news schedule, we talk about how embargoes work, we get into the nitty-gritty like that. Um, another big theme of the programme overall, although it's not a course, is, uh, is risk and uncertainty. Um, now, uh, you, you will no doubt have come across whatever opinion you have about it. The great debate on scientific innumeracy um, uh, among uh, wider publics and the question of whether people could be persuaded um, to understand the world a bit more ma mathematically, particularly whether people's um, statistical awareness can easily be improved or whether there are serious barriers to that. Um, we go through all that, but we go into it in a lot more detail. Um, and we look at related questions about the way people perceive risk, the way people are more likely to pay attention to risks where they can see the outcomes as tangible things. Um, whereas with a lot of the big risks in life, um, the fact that you can't see them means that people are very often a lot happier to take them. And we look at communication strategies for dealing with that. We have a course about science and public policy. Um, so communication, science communication is usually taken as communication to non-experts. Non-experts are not necessarily the public, okay? The prime minister is a non-expert and yet he is not a member of the public in the traditional sense. So how on earth do you talk to these enormously powerful people who don't necessarily know any of what you know and are not prepared to take it on trust? And we have the course that I um, am in charge of, which is about museums and science centres, where those institutions came from, um, how they operate, why they are different, what they're trying to do, how you communicate to different audiences through those spaces. And that course also looks at public events um, more generally. So we bring in various experts like, like Katie here, who've got a range of um, experience talking to public audiences. And um, we, we have some good sort of free ranging discussion sessions. And of course, as I said, a lot of the students have experience of their own and they learn from each other. And um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful learning environment because everybody who's in the room wants to know more about how to communicate, okay? So we don't tend to have um, quiet sessions. Equally, we don't tend to have problems shutting people up because people understand about rules and turn taking and so forth. And with that in mind, I probably had, um, I probably had my time there, haven't I? Should I um, wind up there? Yeah, if that's, yeah, if you've said all the things that you want to say. Yep. 
Cool. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, so if you have any uh, specific questions for James, yes, uh, feel free to use the uh, emoji based reactions or just like do this in front of the camera if you would like to uh, thank James. There's an email address as well. Um, and we can make sure that goes in the chat if you need a, a text version. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions for James, either stick them in the chat now. Um, James can either respond in the chat or we can save them up until we do the kind of Q&A bit afterwards. Um, but yeah, that's really interesting. And it's it's sort of, yeah, we, we do occasionally have people from outside of maths come and talk at these because I think it's probably, you know, some of them might have something useful to say, I guess. Um, but, you know, now back to mathematicians. So we're, we're back on uh, further ground. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm going to hand over to our second speaker. You've already heard a little bit about, but Ben, tell us about your maths communication module. Hello. Um, I think it's, it's downright rude to describe James as outside of maths. <laughs> Clearly you mentioned some numeracy somewhere, but I get Katie's point. Uh, and it is an interesting contrast about what I'm about to describe compared to James. So uh, I am looking forward to some questions about the differences here. Little backstory then, you heard about my job, but I, I was a teacher for 10 years in secondary schools and then I started working for the AMSP doing maths enrichment and teacher training and part of that job then shifted to the University of Bath where they basically just employ me, the AMSP gives them money, but the university got to take uh, some fraction of a percent of my time and they decided that I should teach a module with that. I'm not quite sure how the financial balancing of that works, let's not talk about that. The course that they would like me to get involved with, which I'm happy to be involved with, is the Communicating Mathematics module at the University of Bath. It is a final year undergraduate module for undergraduates uh, of maths. Uh, this word planning, good advance. Um, this has been run for a long time by Chris Budd, and I hope that some of you in this call have come across Chris Budd. He has a lot of experience in the world of maths communication and writing and presentation and all sorts of things, as well as maths research. Um, but it's been running for a long time, since about 2002 is the earliest reference I could find it. He was awarded National Teaching Fellowship uh, grant to set up the course. And we know it's been running this long because at least one of the board members of TMIP, uh, otherwise known as Sam, hi Sam, uh, did this course as part of her degree in 2009. It's been running every year since, mainly with Chris uh, heading it up. There was one year when he was on sabbatical, it was run by Jane White and Ben Sparks. That's me. Um, we had to sort of try and capture a course which existed mostly in someone's head and turn it into something which we could run uh, with a little bit more formal structure. As a result, the formal structure is a little bit better in place now ever since then. And since 2018, the team has been Chris Budd, who's run it for a long time, uh, Tamsin Smith, who's got experience with schools, a secondary teacher as well, now works with university as outreach in maths and me. And we have been trying to figure out how to do this course uh, even before lockdown made us have to change our plans. I would like to give you a very quick summary of how the course looked in the past, uh, how it looked last year because it was an interesting year, and how it might look this year. That's the three things. Before I do that, I would like to ask you for a bit of input from the audience. I would like to ask you, and I'm going to ask Sam to put the poll up in a moment, what do you think, and I'm emphasizing the word you, uh, what do you think is the most compelling reason for a final year maths undergraduate to take a maths communication module? What do you think is the most compelling? Uh, what would compel you if you were one of them? So can you can pick as many of these as you like. We're not going to give you very long, probably just less than a minute to pick uh, any of these ideas. So you might want to do it just to get a good grade without an exam. Receive some input on presentation skills, get a chance to practice live communication. Get to know some classics of mass enrichment. Uh, maybe you need to remember how to write projects in whole sentences. Mathematicians have a reputation. Uh, and maybe they're just trying to replace it, uh, another module which they hate, with something which they think might be easier. Give me 10 more seconds to vote on this. I'll share how we balance out on this. So remember, this is what you think is the most compelling reason for someone to do this. Okay, I'm going to stop the polling there. Here are what the results look like. Uh, and most of you are thinking that uh, the most compelling reason uh, might be to receive input and advice on presentation skills, closely followed by a chance to practice that. And that is a different thing. Um, for what it's worth, I think that all of these reasons are genuine reasons that people have chosen to take 
this course. I would like to do a second poll now, uh, which is a very slightly different question, which is what do you think final year undergraduates would consider the most compelling reasons? So this is different from you. What would a genuine third year undergraduate to do? Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, I would like to, you to consider now, is this different from what you just answered? I'm going to give you 20 more seconds to pick as many of these as you wish. Or fourth year. It's fourth year undergrads as well. That's true. Uh, final year, I should say, rather than third year. But yeah, particularly uh, fourth year could mean they're doing a master's course or they've taken a year uh, in industry or something like that. Uh, five more seconds. And I'm going to end the polling now. So the results this time, maybe you won't be surprised to, to learn because you're all a bunch of cynical gits, uh, that, that getting a good grade without an exam is a very, very appealing prospect for undergraduates. And I do not think we can pretend it is any other way. And the sort of negative version of that of dropping something else that they don't want to do is also a reason why they choose this. It does mean we end up with some people on the course who probably shouldn't be doing this course uh, because they are kind of officially not doing it for the right reasons. And I think practicing and getting input on communication skills is one reason to do the course because of the nature of our course and it was very interesting to hear James say that uh, the, the masters in science communication deliberately can't focus on presentation skills necessarily um, so well, let's see how it compares thank you for your honest uh, results on the poll let me tell you the the three segments I wanted to talk about then so in the past the maths communication course has been a one semester course. It is half a year's unit, six credits in some scheme I don't understand. I don't, actually don't know if credits are worth the same across all universities, and that shows my uh, ignorance. I don't think they are, but it's, it's half of one year's course. Um, to be honest, the amount of work they have to do for this half a year course is, as Sam will tell you, ridiculous uh, on the on the large side they're doing a lot more writing than they've ever done and they're only getting six credits which means i think it is good for them to realize early on in the course that the reason to do this course is not just to get a good grade because it's hard to get a good grade by writing stuff uh, it's to get some experience which they can't get in any other way um, a quick summary of the assessment which gives you a flavor of the course uh, there is no exam it's all on the final write-up and traditionally for the last 15 years or so there have been four components. Uh, every person had to join a group and present a school's fair stall for the Bath Taps into Science Festival. So which is a, where school kids turn up to a huge hall and it's chaos and they're manning a stall saying yay maths and come and do some gambling or something like that. That's the traditional effect. That's one component. They then also in a group, a different group, have to present a Royal Institution masterclass on a Saturday morning. These things that uh, Sam pretty much coordinates around the country uh, and run on Saturday mornings. And we have a group of four of the students maybe get together to present a two and a half hour workshop to some keen mathematicians on a Saturday morning. That's a very different uh, outcome usually from the stall that they set up. And that's an interesting uh, live presentation, different aspect. Two more traditionally, they had to choose an option, uh, something along the lines of maybe they could go to a maths inspiration show and write us up what happened of an, an evaluative option. They could go and deliver a school lesson. They could go and visit a school and do an enrichment lesson. Maybe, and in the past, they've gone to interview some like Dr. Maths, which is Steve Humble up north somewhere, uh, and talk to people about their maths communication. So this is a slightly vague option. Uh, traditionally, very hard to assess that one because we didn't really know what criteria we we're looking for. And finally, they had to create what Chris has called a permanent piece, which I think is code for do something which lasts. So make a video. Uh, create a sculpture, uh, write a website, write a book, make a board game. Uh, and this has been very vague as well, but that's been a, a fourth of the assessment criteria and has resulted in many and various outcomes. Uh, the, the screenplay I had to mark one year was an interesting experience. It was actually amazing. It was actually good. Whereas the song, the cover songs from the top 40 hits with mathematical lyrics, encouraging you to study hard it was not good but it was very clear unclear to me uh, actually and this is the problems i'm picking up later for later on it's very hard to mark this sort of thing particularly when it's marked alongside an exam where they're given a score out of 100 your song was rubbish it was out of tune what do you get 55 
these things are difficult. So that's what's been in the past. Uh, and very quickly, the content, because um, the other two sections are going to be quicker for me, the content was done over about 11 two-hour sessions in a classroom. Things like admin and um, important starting points like child protection issues, unconscious bias. Again, this is an interesting comparison to what James has been mentioning on the science communication course, which is less about that sort of admin risk assessment stuff. But we had to do that because we were sending the students out into schools or to a masterclass environment. Obviously, we give them practical details on the masterclass and the bath tap science. We give them a session on how to evaluate, um, which sometimes is less successful because it ends up basically them learning how to create smiley faces, which kids stick all over their stall. Seriously, not helpful. But anyway, occasionally we will give them a guest lecture presentation, which they try and evaluate using the, the techniques we've taught them. And we have included sessions on how to manage an audience and presentation skills. Again, contrast that with the science communication masters. We then get them to present small sessions to the cohort with their sessions and we give them feedback from the cohort before they go and try it out as a masterclass. Uh, and then they have to write everything up, which is what they're marked on. Uh, and it's assessed on the planning and the delivery and the evaluation of each of those four sections. This is a huge piece of work for half a year's course uh, and that has caused problems. At least I'm being honest about this. Sam is nodding away because she remembers it. Um, but the three problems we experienced was delivery of content was marked based on their own write-up of their delivery because we couldn't go and watch everything. We couldn't get to all the masterclasses. And that is a strange way to mark someone's delivery. I'm sure you can see that. Uh, then we said this, then we said that it was amazing. It's very difficult to give an objective mark on. Uh, uh, secondly, the projects were always, and this is in capitals in my notes, always too long. Uh, I'm not gonna mention a certain student who submitted a project over a hundred pages long. But if you wanna guess about anyone I've named who's doing this project, <laughs> Uh, and as a result, the final and overarching problem is this module is extremely difficult to mark, mark objectively and any comparison with other modules is always awkward. To be honest, we give them roughly a mark between a sort of third and a first class, depending on how quality it is, but it's very difficult to keep this objective. It was double marked to keep some of that happening, but this is tough. Okay, so much quicker then. What we did last year was meant to be the same, but it all had to change. All the fairs were cancelled. Most of the masterclasses were cancelled and we had to uh, not mark their delivery. We had to mark them based on just their planning. And we consequently, and I think actually healthily, put much more emphasis on a reflective evaluation of why did what you plan possibly, why was it possibly going to work and why was it possibly not going to work? How could you make it better? In my opinion, the further we move the course towards that reflective evaluation, the better, and it changes every year. Uh, what we did do interestingly last year, which I'm going to mention again in a moment, is we introduced a new option to replace the stuff that was cancelled, which we call a compare and contrast option. We gave them five options, a mass inspiration DVD talk, uh, they do exist, uh, a number file video, which is out there on the internet, a Hannah Fry's first Christmas lecture from last Christmas, Kit Yates doing a lecture live in Bath, which we recorded, that some of them saw live, and James Grime doing a lecture in Bath, which we also recorded and some of them saw live. We asked them to choose three of those at least one of the live lectures, and to write us an essay uh, comparing and contrasting, uh, examining how they chose their content for the audience, what went well, and how could it be even better. And in hindsight, that was spectacularly useful, and we should have done this every year for the last 20 years. I'm not sure why we haven't, but, uh, and as a result, what we're gonna do next year is put that front and center of the module. That's gonna be the first thing we ask them to do. It'll be the first thing they hand in, hopefully early on in the course, but it will be part of the final mark. Um, so finally, what we're going to do this coming year, we're going to have to be online, compare and contrast section early on to expose them to what's out there, because some of them have no idea uh, that YouTube exists. Uh, seriously, I, I feel like Numberphile is a great example of mass communication in the current world, uh, and we have to show them where the website was, but hopefully others will have come across it. We are going to try and do a live masterclass with the Royal Institution. We're going to try and do that in Zoom with breakout rooms. Uh, Sam is laughing because who knows how that's going to work. We are finally then going to give the third, uh, only three parts, compare and contrast, a live masterclass, so some sort of live delivery in a group, and finally, some content creation, where we ask them to create a thing, a video, a Desmos classroom activity, an enrichment pack. We would also like to include in our delivery a greatest hits session, where we showcase some classics of mathematics enrichment. And that came across because we were curious that anyone could come out of a, a six month maths communication module and still not know what a Mervius strip was we decided that we had to occasionally show them some of those classics because if we don't tell them about Martin Gardner's books, no one else is going to do it. This year, we're going to have to change our marking policy and we're still writing that as we speak. And that I think is enough 
from me. Lots of talk. Thanks for your contributions in the voting. Oh, fantastic. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not muted. That's good. Uh, so that's it's it's really interesting to hear kind of the difference between something that's quite practice based and something that's quite theory based. And I'm I'm always sort of intrigued by this because um, the the you know people do research into science communication and into how best to do it. Um, and I'm often intrigued as to how much of that research actually makes it through to people doing the science communication. So some of the theory stuff might be an interesting thing to to sort of include. Um, but yeah, I, I suspect people are going to get practical experience doing it um, if it's an MSc that's designed to be part of their career going forward. But if it's a thing they're doing while they're at uni and then they're going to go off and get a job doing some proper maths, then maybe not. Um, but yeah, that is very interesting. So our third speaker um, is going to talk about uh, a, a module similar to the one uh, that Ben's just described, but that didn't exist until recently. So um, kind of a little bit more on the sort of the process of developing such a thing. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Francesca. Yeah, hello. Um, so uh, just to say who I am, I'm Francesca. I work at the University of Edinburgh and I'm the Motto Engagement Officer there. Uh, so my job consists of uh, uh, both doing math communication and schools or science festivals and coordinating math communication done by other people and a bit of uh, training students in math communication skills. Um, so that's, uh, well, that's mainly why I'm here. Um, so part of my job last year has been um, designing a module on math outreach. I'm going to talk about this uh, course that I designed last year called Communicating Math to the Public. Uh, you will notice that the title of the course is inspired to the uh, course in math. Yeah, a bit of plagiarism, Ben, sorry about that. Uh, but um, so um, unfortunately, I can't talk about students' experience yet because the course is not run yet. So what I'm going to talk about is um, the planning stage, um, then the course itself, how it should run. Uh, then, well, COVID-19 happened just when I was going to submit the course proposal. So how COVID-19 screwed my plans a bit. And uh, then the backup plan. So uh, let us start with the planning stage. Um, let's say that um, running this kind of course has been uh, on my mind since three years ago when I started my job uh, and one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of the reasons was to give some form of academic credit to students who were helping with the uh, outreach at the School of Math and were doing it as volunteers. Um, so, uh, but uh, the plan became more concrete uh, last year, uh, around March, when my head of school asked me to take a lead in uh, designing a course on math communication. Um, so at that point, uh, I was in two minds. So uh, a part of me was very excited about uh, this prospect, but uh, the other part of me was freaking out because I had never designed a university course, and this would have been a course which was uh, completely different from any other course, course in a math degree. Uh, so, uh, how did I um, get started from scratch, from scratch? So, first of all, uh, talk to colleagues. So, um, first talk to the director of teaching in my school. Sorry, maybe I should uh, say this from the beginning. So, in Scottish universities, departments are, are called schools. Uh, that that may be a bit confusing, but yeah. So um, I talked to the director of teaching just to ask him how um, how this kind of course would fit in the degree, what year it should be for, and so on. Um, and then I contacted colleagues who had experience uh, planning or running this kind of course. So uh, I talked to uh, Chris Budd from Bath, who was mentioned 15 minutes ago. Um, I found out that there was a course in um, the School of Geosciences in Edinburgh about geosciences outreach, which had run for 15 years. So I talked to my uh, colleagues from geosciences and asked about their experience and asked them to share their wisdom. Um, and um, so uh, 
I liaised to the, uh, with the teaching program committee in my school, so the uh, people who are more, most involved with teaching, and I ran some focus group with students to understand what students wanted. Um, uh, just uh, at the time when I was starting drafting the proposal for the course, uh, my colleague from physics came to me uh, telling me uh, we would like to uh, run a course on physics outreach in our school. Um, so we um, would you like to collaborate and do something together? And um, we agreed that uh, I really welcomed that suggestion. We agreed that that would uh, maximize resources. And uh, it, was, uh, it would have been a good thing to work together um, on designing the course. Um, so uh, how about the course? Um, well, uh, I should say it took ages to uh, write the course proposal and it, it was amended many times. Uh, but this is how the course uh, is supposed to run. So it would be uh, aimed at final year students, which in Scotland are fourth year students. Um, it would be a project-based course. Um, it would be worth 20 credits, which means 200 hours of student work. Um, and uh, it runs over two semesters, where the first semester is mostly dedicated to workshops and training, while the second semester is mostly dedicated to the, pro the project. Um, the project, as you may imagine, would be um, very practical, and uh, would be uh, would consist of delivering a package of math outreach in uh, schools or museums or the community depending on what students choose and uh, students would work in groups on the projects and uh, the projects would be supervised by myself or other colleagues who are uh, experienced in outreach and all projects would be second marked um, as for the first semester, um, students would uh, attend 11 workshops, which would be two hours long, uh, plus a couple of more, uh, more practical workshops in the um, second semester. And um, the, so these workshops were, let's say, um, in the middle of what um, James was saying and Ben was saying. So Ben was saying uh, it is our, our course is mostly practical, while James was saying our course is mostly theoretical. We uh, are planning to include both theory and practice. So some of the workshops would be uh, training on skills that are needed for math communication, such as presentation skills or planning, team management, project management, while other workshops would be uh, more theoretical and uh, examining, for example, um, the role of public engagement in our society and how it has changed, um, things about well, uh, the uh, social background uh, and, um, in Scotland and widening participation. Um, there would be something about pedagogy and how to fit enrichment talks into the school curriculum. Um, and um, and uh, each of the sessions would run by an expert in the relevant area. Um, uh, as I said, writing the proposal took a lot of time. And uh, just to share two things uh, I had to be very careful about. Uh, one was framing the course into the uh, academic literature. Um, and that was uh, very tricky at first for me uh, because my approach to public engagement, as Katie was saying, has always been quite practical and I was always learned by mistakes. Um, and in that, uh, what was very helpful for me was talking to my colleagues in geosciences and to people who taught on the uh, science communication degree in Edinburgh uh, and get a bit of their uh, knowledge. And um, second point I had to be very careful about uh, was how to plan assessment, the assessment and make sure that uh, the 
intended learning outcomes were properly assessed and making sure that the assessment was balanced over the two semesters and it wasn't too heavy in the second semester not too wasn't too heavy on the project and also make sure that the that part of the assessment uh, included a kind of literature review uh, right then uh, okay the proposal was ready uh, ready to be submitted to the board of studies and in the meantime covid 19 happened uh, lockdown happened um, so uh, that screwed a bit my, my plans. So the course was approved by the, the Board of Studies, but uh, at that time the university was uh, uh, planning to move all teaching online. So uh, it was decided that the course wouldn't uh, start, would, wouldn't run this year, but uh, it would start hopefully next year. Um, to be honest, I need to say that I, well, I found this decision sensible because, uh, and I myself would have found, would have been a bit worried of starting this course, which was completely different from other courses and running it for the first time online. Uh, but um, at that point, I came up with a backup plan. So uh, I suggested that for this year, I could supervise some uh, undergraduate projects, which uh, would be uh, would focus on uh, on planning and delivering outreach activities. And this suggestion was welcome by by my colleagues and by the school. Um, and uh, I'm very happy about this. I'm very excited about this. And this will give all, will also give me the uh, a good experience when it comes then to run the course hopefully next year. Um, so uh, as for the projects, uh, it will be uh, two groups of final year students. I can't say much yet because I, uh, I'm gonna meet the students um, in the two coming weeks. Uh, but um, so my ideas for the project are uh, that one of the groups would work on um, designing and running math clubs for secondary school students uh, while another group can uh, run family clubs uh, in collaboration with edinburgh libraries and possibly scottish libraries um, this uh, in order to reach a broader audience uh, obviously all uh, activities will be delivered online this year um, I think that uh, this kind of projects would uh, really help students in their skill development because they would uh, learn communication skills and organization skills. And also this kind of project would uh, add value to the uh, outreach program of, uh, uh, of the School of Math. Um, however, I'm looking forward to uh, meeting the students and I will take on board their suggestions. Um, okay, so. Uh, thank you. Sorry if I went over a bit, but uh, just to finish with uh, main tips if you are if you want to start um, to plan such a course from scratch and it would be talk to colleagues uh, who have experience in the sector, liaise, so get the head of school on board and liaise with the director of teaching in your school um, and uh, talk to students to uh, try to understand what they want. And here, this is my email address and the Edinburgh Outreach website, if you want to contact me. Um, I will, I'm going to share. Cool, okay. Um, so thank you very much uh, to all three of our speakers. Again, if you want to do, we didn't do this for Ben, but if you want to do clapping, please do. Um, so I realise that it is currently five to five, so there may be some people, including Ben, who need to disappear off uh, at or shortly after five. Um, so what I will do is just do a quick um, promo, I guess, for the next event that we're doing in case anyone does need to disappear at five. Um, just to check, are our other speakers OK to hang on for a bit for a bit more Q&A? Yep. OK, so it looks like we'll have everyone except Ben. Uh, so if you've got any questions for Ben, get them in quickly so that he can answer them before he goes. Um, so um, 
that's, this has been really interesting and I'm, I'm kind of I'm making loads of notes. This is great. Um, so our next session is sort of slightly provisional. Yes, Sam may be able to answer questions about Ben's uh, module given that she's done it. Um, so the, the next session that we've got planned uh, will hopefully be, we're going to try and alternate with these sessions between something that's sort of a panel-y thing like this and something that's a bit more of a workshop where you can actually um, um, kind of pick up some skills. Um, so our next session is potentially going to be the 29th of October um, at the same time um, and it will be a GeoGebra session. So if you have always wanted to know what this GeoGebra thing is that everyone keeps going on about uh, or if you're already familiar with it and you want to see a few of the things about how it can be uh, useful, Ben's obviously started screen sharing some GeoGebra of course, um, it's a, a dynamic geometry system that allows you to do uh, various mathematical things. Um, and it's been, I think, quite useful for a lot of people in the sort of online context to do the equivalent of what would be a demo uh, in, in the real world, which might involve some actual physical objects and moving stuff around. You can do all of that in GeoGebra and it will animate for you. So um, we'll put the details out on the same mailing list that this one's gone out on, uh, but 29th of October. Uh, four o'clock. I think it will be an hour and a half session, uh, so four till 5.30, um, and we'll try and get in some other guests to tell us a little bit about how they've been using GeoGebra uh, and the interesting things they've done with it. Um, there are indeed the, some experts on the call, I think. So. I, I sort of imagine so, yeah. You'll be getting an email shortly. Um, we've, we've not planned anything at the last minute at all, honest. Um, the only <laughs> other thing I wanted to mention before people disappear, if anyone is going to disappear, is that there is, uh, so there are various universities around the UK that offer uh, science communication master's courses so there's the Manchester has one I think Salford still does um, and there, were, there was until recently one at Man Met as well so there were like three in Manchester alone um, there's University of West of England in Bristol Edinburgh is another one UCL I think has one as well um, but just to say that UWE has um, um, just started advertising a short course that they're running starting in January uh, which will be I think uh, 10 weeks or something along that kind of line um, which is it's a paid for course it's about 750 pounds but it is sort of a, a kind of basic intro to science communication course so if it's the kind of thing that you're interested in uh, please have a look at the details on there I, I have to disclose I'm currently doing one of their other online uh, courses right right now <laughs> in fact I'm in week two it's going really well uh, I'm very much enjoying having student discount again um, so <laughs> um, if, if that's the kind of thing you're interested in uh, feel free to check that out and also keep an eye out for other kind of training of this sort as well 